Greetings, Spare Sharpens and Retrogrades. It's Friday, so we have another CMask episode for you, and it's a special Friday, the most special one of the year. Have a very holy good Friday, everybody out there. Uh, me and the boys here are in the middle of a Trader One fast, so everybody's uh, a bit hungry. Joining today, aside from usual Dr. Michael Robillard, is... Nicholas Stumphauser, who is a director of six films, you know his latest, in all likelihood, it is an excellent film, and it took America and the West by storm, died suddenly. So, Mike, uh, Nick, welcome, and uh, good to see you guys. Yeah, same here. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it, Tim. Yeah, Nick, I figured today we're going to be talking about Instead of doing a, an all-out Good Good Friday theme, the theme of abandonment is mildly connected to something we did two weeks ago on CMask, which is this. The, the Miyagi complex in the West, which is well-developed in this book, my, my second book, it's rule number 21, beware the Miyagi complex. I'll, I'll cue that up in a second. But by way of introduction, I'd just say, the Miyagi complex here in America is most aptly spread. It's promulgated and it's infiltrated our, our culture, whereupon men do not look to Western fathers or even Western father surrogates. We look to the East for some strange reason. We're going to talk about why. We do so probably because it's taken such a foothold in Hollywood, in film. And so having you, a film director, Nick, is... Uh, a real treat today. I want to. I want to get right into it. But um, if you want to, if you want to plug anything, uh, now's the time to do it, Nick. Uh, no, 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 nothing to plug. Just uh, any excuse to nerd out with you about a film is is a good day for me. Yeah, yeah. Look, so here's I mean, me too. We we're just talking about Lord of the Rings and what a great tradition it informs to watch Lord of the Rings films. During the, the Triduum, uh, arguably Thursday, Friday, Holy Saturday, do the three films in Lord of the Rings. And of course, extended editions. Now, that Catholic work, Lord of the Rings, forms a stark counterpoint, foil, whatever, to basically every movie we're going to talk about today, we're going to name. And we're not just going to rattle off a list. We're going to talk about a few in greater detail, of course, the Karate Kid. But we will rattle through a list just to show folks how ubiquitous the Miyagi complex is. It's Rule 21. I'll just read for the audience what that is in case you didn't catch our other show. Or if you're insane and you haven't read this amazing book, the complex works like this. Virtue is so rare in the West that in order to make any sense to the young Western mind, the perceived model of excellence must be sufficiently abstract or foreign, or read oriental. A uh, mentor of the Far East turns out to be the only plausible candidate befitting the requirements of this semi-traditional moral exemplar. Semi-traditional because by way of nature, all men create crave a mentor who teaches them honor and, and, and virtue. We're talking, of course, about the Karate Kid's Mr. Miyagi. Bankrupt Western culture sees literal and figurative Daniel Sons everywhere Fatherless, either actually like Daniel or functionally like any kid whose dad fails to teach him what he needs to know. Society's Cobra Kai or secular humanist culture prey on these many Daniel sons being raised defenselessly by single mothers who usually love them but ne neglect to teach them because they are incapable. Manly virtue like fighting or honor or self-defense. Now, I want to talk about the Judeo-Buddhism that runs hand in hand with the Miyagi complex in today's show, because that is what Hollywood is teaching and preaching is Judeo-Buddhism on the one hand, no Western Christian father figures who are based or admirable in any way. They're just absent. We live in the age of absconding fathers, like Benedict said, and Karate Kid is the best place to start. What do you guys say? Yeah, Karate Kid is the best place to start. Uh especially for our generation. I mean, maybe you could, you could go back and 
okay, like proto karate kid, proto Miyagi ism, but I, I think it really crystallizes, crystallizes with karate kid. Uh, yeah, Daniel's father is, uh, is he dead or, or um, divorced? I, I don't know what the, I forget the backstory, but like he doesn't have a dad. Uh, divorced. He's, yeah. Right, yeah. He's this wayward kid, doesn't know how to uh, stand up for himself. And then he comes across Mr. Miyagi, who is the, the superior father figure who's wise and his, his ways are esoteric and yeah. he, he, you know, so like even his teaching methods aren't uh, immediately intelligible at some points, the, the wax on wax off makes sense, but like it, for, it takes a while for his teaching to even like the point of it or the, the kernel wisdom to finally come out. Uh, and uh, I think that theme is there as well in, in a lot of the Miyagi is and more generally that the, the pedagogical method is um, re really difficult to understand, but 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 trust me, you you go through this really confusing, um, nonsensical like set of things, and then eventually at the end you get the, you get the wisdom out of it. I think that's part of it as well. Agreed. Yeah, Nick, what do you, what do you say here? You you're from. A younger generation you're a zoomer whereas michael and i are are older millennials but karate kid is the template and i don't think there for for reasons that i can get into later i don't think there is a proto miyagi i think this only took a foothold in the 80s mm -hmm. what do you say nick well of course we're talking about the the jaden smith film right <laughs> yeah yeah exactly with, with, with jackie chan okay um yeah well I don't know if there was a film prior to almost said Lord of the Rings, this fast is getting to me um, prior to karate kid where the father was, was obviously absent. Um, you know, I'm trying to think through like films from that era. Cause I think that was 85, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. 84, 85. So I really love to look at, um, films in the context of like the decade or the generation that they were coming from, because to me that really informs like what was trying to be pushed, what was trying to be presented in the culture as relevant, as cool, as chic, um, or as meaningful. And, and then also you have like establishment and non-establishment films. And I would definitely proposed that Karate Kid is like an establishment. This is Hollywood collaborating. We've worked on a script together. We know like, here's our target demographic. Here's the, um, you know, 11 to 25 year olds of um, probably mostly male with their girlfriends who are going to go and watch this movie. And so in 85, like you have what was the greatest generation who was emotionally lobotomized um and then their their kids are the ones who are going to see this movie right 1985 uh would be children of the parents of like the 1950s ish give or take you know it's so like my dad's generation my dad's 55 years old so you know he was probably going to see karate kid with his friends and his girlfriends um and their their parents like just like never hugged their kids or or said the words like, I'm proud of you, son. Um, and that's like a ubiquitous problem. So to have then this film, like I think Hollywood absolutely knew what they were doing when they're presenting this story um, of the of the Eastern, of the Eastern father. But I, I don't know if there's a proto. I'm not sure if there's if there's any before that. And I do think it's because it's on the heels of a generation that had no relationship with their children specifically fathers to their sons yeah two 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 caveats to what you just said the eastern father figure the miyagi the miyagi type who also was stoic but he was just uh, justifiably stoic eastern pseudo stoicism it's buddhism shintoism confucianism this has a reason underneath it whereas western fatherly right. stoicism mm, that you're correct. talking about that's baseless so so they're, they're sacralizing a, a still it, what remains a pseudo philosophy, not hugging your kids, fathers, not being the best friend to your kids, fathers, the way Aristotle says you should be fathers and sons. You're, it's a friendship of unequals, but a friendship all the same. 
Uh, so that's the first point. The, the, uh, Hollywood is giving people something to chew on. And the second point, like you said, Hollywood knew what they were doing in 84, 85. They knew that everyone out there, almost everyone, 99% of kids are Daniel sons, whether or not they were the sons of de deceased or divorced fathers. They have these dads that were functionally absent. So it was relevant to everyone. I remember the first year I got married, weeks after I got married, I came back from honeymoon to a job teaching part-time at Compton Community College, teaching Plato and Aristotle to inner city kids and commuting back and forth to uh, an inner city Bakersfield, California, public high school. So I was doing both day and night job. Very, very inner city first year of marriage for me. And uh, this kid, Saul, I won't say his last name, was like a hood uh, Mexican kid, got in lots of fights. He and I became became sort of friendly, not as friendly as I would become when I went to Catholic school with a lot of the students. But he told me, he was like, yo, man, karate kid, that's a story of my damn life. You know, he's like, I'm Daniel. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. I mean, I respected that he 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 got that movie because it is a great film. Let's not lie. But I, I respected that he was younger. And this is in 2005. And he loved Karate Kid. I thought that made him cool. And it, it did. But but it, it just proves what you're saying. Yeah. And I think they also knew what they were doing by making uh, Miyagi stoic. Well, and also like men, father figures are stoic. Like fathers, patriarchs are stoic in at least a generalized sense in that like they're, they're not neurotic, they're not frenetic, they aren't reactive to, to stress or to pain. Um, they know how to deal with a young spirit, somebody who's you know, a 15 or 18, whatever, how old Daniel's son was. Um, so he is stoic in that sense, but um, it's sort of like the attentiveness that Miyagi had, I think is what they were saying is, Right. Oh, well, I'm going to I'm going to pay attention to you. you're going to show up at my dojo and I'm going to counsel you. It's like what well, every kid mm -hmm. wants that. My goodness, of course, I want that. Yeah. Yeah. John Kreese has stoic elements, too. But yeah, he's he's like on his moments where he's unhinged and he's he's overbearing and, and his his me his methods are they're excessively spartan and they don't make sense. And, he, and he, yeah, he's emotionally unhinged. Yeah, contrast against Miyagi, well, who's yeah even keeled, and that's I think what a perfect foil too. Like okay, yeah. so the yeah. white, the white American guy, is mm -hmm. basically a brute. Yeah, yeah, he's a bully. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. I the, mean, come on. Yeah, it's so <laughs> it's spelled out so perfectly. The only white father figure in Karate Kid is who's not a complete pansy for lack of a better term there is a better term but we won't use it who's not a complete pansy is a brute and that mm -hmm. that is the that is the dichotomy choose hey kids who do you who do you want raising you you know i think about the end of karate kid right. when spoiler alert john crease dishonorable sensei who has um mentored young johnny the whole time to be a bully he's created a bully out of johnny he starts beating him up and Mr. Miyagi steps in and actually defends the bully, young Johnny, from the master bully, John Kreese. OK, so kids pick. Who do you want? This Chinese grandpa or whatever, you know, Okinawan grandpa, who's nice and teaches you to catch flies with chopsticks and, and other weird Eastern mm -hmm. stuff. You know, it's weird. But and the methods are esoteric. Um there's a there's a noble savage like practical wisdom to Miyagi. He, he even mm -hmm. speaks in savage aphoristic grunts, but it's always wise. Uh, so it's unorthodox, but it's wise. Do you want that, or do you want this dick face? You know, uh, John Kreese, who's going to beat you up if you lose, and and teach you to beat other people up. It's obvious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even the even the uh, the avatar for the audience member, because again, like when I was when I was studying film. Um, I was taught by uh, a producer woman, um, I'll just call her Kat, uh, Catherine, who was um, very savvy, very much part of the industry. And one of the exercises that she had us do is she's like, okay, so here's a film. Here's your film idea. Who's the demographic? And she's yeah. like, you can't say everybody. It's not everybody. Everybody mm -hmm. is not going to watch your movie. You have to like 
really hone in on the group and like Dungeons and Dragons just came out like this Chris Pine movie. And I, I watched this trailer and I was able to, in my mind, like break down exactly who is going to go watch that film and why that film is going to make $250 million. And it's not just in the United States, it's abroad and so on. So when you, that, that aside, um, who's watching, uh, karate kid it's like well it's i'm gonna blank on the actor's name tell me the actor. ralph macchio ralph macchio okay so you have somebody who's the age of ralph macchio going to see this film and ralph macchio's some racially ambiguous character his mother is also racially ambiguous then his surrogate father is chinese but the blue-eyed blonde-haired anglo mm. counterpart is evil yeah. so you you go see this movie and you and it's like the, this is what hollywood does is you have um these um expansive uh stories that basically are designed to interject and inject very small amounts of um subversion in it and in this case it's it's the fatherhood and then the rejection of your own of your own people yeah, which play upon mm. the re, uh, what you're saying is play upon the lived experience of the audience. So like everyone's like, right, yeah, right. I don't I don't have a dad. I either don't have a dad simplicitaire or I just don't have a dad who gives a damn about me getting my ass kicked at public school. Uh, it's not usually by blonde haired, blue eyed kids anymore. I don't know about the early 80s. I was like three. But, um, it, you know, it's usually by at public school, you're getting your ass kicked by other races for being white now, but my dad doesn't care. So I, I really want someone to teach me I, as we expand this out in the next segment, I want to stay with karate kid now, but as we talk about some of the other films where you see the exact same themes, I actually thought at the last minute of kill bill where you have a, an Asian Eastern Miyagi figure mentor, not as nice as Miyagi uh, Pai Mei to in this case it's Uma Thurman because it's postmodern so she's the protagonist give me a break but it's the same thing and the same male male fatherhood uh dynamic is captured there's a scene where she says of of Bill the main character who's kind of a protagonist antagonist like most men who never knew their fathers Bill collected father figures and Pai Mei is one of them and there are others they they're all from different parts of the world they're all different races which is the same phenomenon that's begun by the Miyagi type, the Miyagi archetype. But look, so there's between the Miyagi figure, uh, an Eastern father figure for a, a bankrupt Western culture kid who doesn't know his, his white Christian dad or, or, or never had one in the first place. You, this meets the Judeo Buddhism of the film with the little twist they put on that you're referring to, Nick. This has a trope, a set of tropes that had been around for 250 years embedded into literary romanticism, particularly coming out of France, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, called the noble savage. Mm -hmm. So these three themes met up and metastasized in American film, Miyagi figure, noble savage, and the Judeo-Buddhism. And here are all the elements you're looking for. There's always an it, it idealized indigene figure. If it's a Western that stays Western, by the way, the Eastern the Eastern figure is the noble savage, the Indian, um, the idealized indigene. But in, most of the time, they look back to the East, to the Far East. There's the, the speculative wisdom of Miyagi. He says some deep things, or the Miyagi type. There's the noble savage-like practical wisdom of Miyagi. He's less articulate when he's saying a bit of practical wisdom. This just means prudence. Again, it's savage, aphoristic grunts that Mr. Miyagi says, you know, what are you, some kind of girl or something? Which is great when they could say that, when Daniel throws very weak punches. Um, so the, the practical wisdom of the Miyagi type is counterintuitive to Westerners. Like um, Mike said, it's uh, esotericism to us. He's teaching you to paint a fence, but really he's teaching you how to block. What the hell? Uh, it's always romantic and past looking. It, think of how many in this list that we're we're gonna 
rattle off uh, in the next section. How many of them have the last blank in the title? The last samurai, hmm. uh, the last of the Mohicans set the type for it. The noble savage, I would say. Mm. Uh, there's a moral corruption of the push west in America. This means uh, manifest destiny. In the on the global scale, if we're talking far east, the push west means Western civilization writ, writ large. There's a moral need to return eastward, the opposite of the point of the Great Gatsby. You will become more moral as you look back to the east. Uh, Western civilization is is conceptually corrupt. It's genetically corrupt. There's a needlessness. Um, oh, 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 nature is inherently good. And the noble savage, mm. whether it's a Miyagi type mm. or a Chingachgook type, um, because he lives out in nature and he only wears a little like loincloth underpant thing, uh, he's a noble savage. He's more in touch with nature than some whitey, you know, mm. than some white guy that wears pants. What the hell? You're You're weird if you wear pants. Now the new cool is... You don't wear pants because you're saying this about nature. And this is where the Judeo Buddhism is really potent. You make this claim about nature. What are you really saying about the need for a redemptor? Well, if nature is good, if the slate's already clean, you don't need Jesus. And therefore Christianity is an exercise in futility. And it's part of the problem rather than the solution. I can't even believe I'm saying these things on Good Friday. All that's needed, therefore, is a Buddhist or Shinto or shape-shifting savage religion uh, uh religions kind of approach to suffering which is just at best an eastern pseudo stoicism whether it's confucianism buddhism shintoism or the the um the noble savages earth worship it's all just hey take your lumps all life is uh suffering and desire you get rid of suffering you get rid of desire vice versa so these elements are all there in the Miyagi type, and most of them are there in most of the other movies we're going to talk about. But it, it's all saying repudiate Western civilization, repudiate the father figures that have already rejected you. So reject in rejection. Look East, find your own father figure. You got to find your own, though. It's an Eastern one. There's a lot there. What do you guys say about all that? something as you were saying that um just reminded me another feature about the miyagi character is that they they make him he, he's not he's not just any old soldier that fights from world war ii he's he's a uh, medal of honor winner so you know he's he's a better soldier at protecting the west than your grandfather and his generation was too so he's like yeah. on even on yeah. that level he's he's a he's a better patriarchal man than than um, what you would find in your own tradition. That's an important component. And also what happened to him? You have to read the little newspaper clipping. He, his, his wife and kid were interned in California. And they, uh, I forget what the internment camp in California was that was upheld by FDR Supreme Court in the famous, infamous Korematsu decision. So he was a better fighter than your stupid white grandpa kids who doesn't love you. <laughs> and won't, teach, won't protect you against bullies. He's a better fighter than him. And as a reward, your stupid racist white mm -hmm. grandpa interned him and probably cheered when Miyagi's only child and wife died in childbirth. Probably. Mm -hmm. right. that, that's that's yeah, all part yeah. of the. Think of how subversive it is. Yeah. But, yeah. but Karate Kid feels like a very positive movie. This is the ingenious dark magic of some movies that we grew up with particularly me and you mike mm -hmm. well it, it's very subversive but it feels very positive i yep. think th there are so many levels of magician of magic trick to what's happening here um the like karate kid works and the and miyagi as a father figure worked and resonated with their demographic their target demographic um, in the same way that pornography works in their tar target demographic, like pornography doesn't work because sex is bad. It works because sex is good. Like you're, you're advertising something that is good that you, you have a longing for, which is like the union of, of men and women and like the sexual act. Well, it's like, well, uh, you, know, you want your dad to pay attention to you. That's good. You want your dad to tell you he's proud of you and mentor you. That's good. So wait, like, where's the subversion here? Mm -hmm. Well, right. it's it's like it's the peripheral. It's the peripheral subversion. And so you have um, what traditionally matriarchal 
emotions or uh, expressions, right? Which is consideration and empathy and concern and attentiveness um, that you typically find in a mother now being exemplified in a father. And the audience goes, well, like the, the target audience, um, you know, the, the 17 year old kid watching this goes, wow, that really hits home. Like my dad is three Bud Lights deep by the time I get home from school and like has never been proud of me in my entire life. So you think, well, this is, this is good. This is what my father should be. Um, right. And especially in that time too, like the, the Eastern thought and like the, oh, go take LSD and, you know, uh, tune in, drop out, stuff like that was, was very predominant. So um, it, it was sort of a, a cultural um, knife in between the ribs. And I'll, I'll get back to that in just a second. Another point that I wanted to make about the, the, how the, the East shifts from patriarchy to matriarchy. And I'm not talking about the East, like, um, you know, Japan or China, which were indeed conquerors and whatnot, but sort of like the cultural East, which hasn't really done anything with anything, right? They're kind of sitting in mud and telling you that nothing matters. And it's, it's actually a good thing that nothing mm -hmm. matters. In fact, right. that's the point of all of this is that nothing matters. And if you just spend time with me, your mentor, you too will realize that nothing matters <laughs> and you are the dirt that you're sitting in. Well, part of the way that they get there is actually through diet. Like when you eat like a traditional Eastern diet of, of tofu and all these things, you're restricting uh, nutrients that are absolutely vital for male virility. They're, they're critical for it. And this is kind of why the archetype of a, of an Eastern uh, mentor or sensei is like, doesn't look healthy. Like they're kind of malformed and aged and pudgy and um, not a striking example of, of virility. So in addition to the the cultural milieu of okay we're shifting from patriarchy patriarchy to matriarchy you also have the actual substance of the east is neutering it's feminizing like right. it's, it's estrogenic to mm -hmm. have the eastern thought and the eastern diet and all these things like that so i think there's just so many levels of of trickery because it does work. It is real. You do want your dad to say, I love you and I'm proud of you. But by presenting that in this package and, and Tim, you've, you've mentioned this several times. And in fact, you and I had this conversation separately and it, it was very striking to me. Like the, this um, repeated prose from the boomer and greatest generations of the parent is not the friend of the child yep goes so deep that it's it's considered revolutionary to say the alternative which is that like you no know, fathers and sons um have philos it's unequal but they have philos so no i'll, I'll leave it there that was yeah. that was quite wait, a ramble wait. No, 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 that was good. And there's a, a collection principle. There's two things I want to pick up on. La the last thing you said first, this is part of the magic, what they're putting in these movies. Miyagi and Daniel's son are friends. It is a friendship of unequals, but this is what a real father is supposed yes. to be. Yes. Aristotle says, fathers and sons are friends. It's a friendship of unequals, but it can be like a ben best friendship. That's exactly what you have with Daniel's son and Miyagi. I, I, I tear up every time I see it. I'm not saying I don't like this movie, by the way, anybody. It's, but it's pornography. But, but, it's out of context. It's the good is out of thing context. out of context. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. Imagine Daniel's son's 16th birthday. He gives him a car. Very fatherly thing to do. And he gives him his, his uh, gi. And um, Daniel is tearing up. And I, I tear up when I see it because everyone wants a father that loves him like this, like you said, Nick. And he says, you're the best friend I ever had. And then uh, Miyagi, again, in his savage, aphoristic, uh, <laughs> Eastern grunt says, uh, uh, you pretty good too. And you're like, this is exactly what Aristotle's describing. It's the subversive Eastern version. Right. But it is what Aristotle described, which is non-disordered. It's at its most well-ordered state in the West if you do Aristotle like 
everything else. Um, there's also the moment where you address the nihilism, Nick. These movies with the Judeo-Buddhism, the Miyagi figure, they're telling you, oh, it's Buddhism, it's Confucianism, it's nihilism, we are nothing, have no desires. But really, they're contradicting that. Facially, they're, they're showing nihilism. But what, what they're really giving you is, but this relationship between Miyagi and Daniel's son really do matter. He, he does crave a father figure and, and Miyagi craves to be his mentor and they love each other like a father and son. So it's bullshit. It's bullshit to say that um, it, this is actually Buddhism. Bo real Buddhism is terrible. They believe in nothingism. But so it's it's Judeo-Buddhism where it's packed in. There's a Western impulse to it because everyone wants something. But instead, they show Buddhism. It's very, very magical. Uh, whereas what it's supplanting is in the West. What's the Western teaching? The Aristotomist teaching. Do you have desires? Yes. Like Thomas Aquinas says, every single desire, this is the exact opposite of Buddhism, is good. You just have to order it properly. Not having desires is disordered. So, so Buddhism is the worst thing you can teach someone. So, so, good. so the good. West, it really does take your desires. And if you do it in the Aristotomist way, it makes you into complete man. And you can justify why you crave a father and a father craves a son. But since we're not being given true Western philosophy in the schools, in the news media, in the entertainment media, in the sports media, in the military, in the government, in our law affair, in any of it, we just think... Well, what they're depicting as my angry, racist, white, unloving, absent, drunk, bully father, this must be what Christianity <laughs> really is. And on the pornography point, by the way, that's so deeply woven into the Judeo-Buddhism of Karate Kid, I will say this, and this is all I'll say. We don't have to go deep. Al Goldstein, the founder of the 1974 porn magazine, Screw!, said the following, and I'm quoting him directly so no one write me angry emails. The only reason that we Jews are in pornography is that we think Catholicism sucks. And then he says something about Christ to the similar effect. I'm not even going to repeat it on Good Friday. We and I don't believe in authoritarianism. So he's attacking fathers and Western fathers, which are supposed to be Christian fathers, Partly because they've already given up. And I want to address what came first, chicken or the egg. Is this art imitating life or life imitating art? We'll get to that in a second. He goes on. Um, Pornography thus becomes a way of defiling Christian culture. And as it penetrates to the very heart of the American mainstream and is no doubt consumed by those very same wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, even though we just mentioned Catholicism. Hmm. Um, its subversive character becomes more charged. And I would argue that its subversive character, the, the, the revolutionary ethos of porn is right there in Karate Kid, right there in the other um, um, Miyagi complex movies we're going to talk about. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, another one I loved. Last mm -hmm. Samurai, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Star Wars is just Judeo-Buddhism. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Avatar, Kill Bill. Is it also there in American Westerns that are romantic? The noble savage ones like Legends of the Fall, Last of the Mohicans, Dances with Wolves. Yes, yes, yes. That's just a version in the West where you stay in the West, but you still reject the West. That's mm -hmm. what the American mm -hmm. Western is. What yep. do you say? I didn't consider that last sentence that the uh, American Western is where you stay in America, but reject the West. Yeah, the, at fine. least the noble savage ones are. I'll say that. They're good Westerns. I don't think you right. see this in Tombstone. I don't think you see it in true Western. I don't think you see it in Magnificent Seven, even though Magnificent Seven is based on what? Seven Samurai. Mm -hmm. that, that director was looking to Seven Samurai, but I don't see a lot of Noble Savage. The true Western, even, even the Spaghetti Western, is cel a celebration of the West and not a celebration of the Noble Savage, but it started creeping its way into even Eastwood's Spaghetti Westerns. Um, yeah, you, you do have to look at who is the architects of the film and of the genre at the time. And, you know, Operation Mockingbird in the 50s was a, an explicit and implicit collaboration between the OSS, the CIA and, and Hollywood, um, even to the point like 
um, Mission, not Mission Impossible, James Bond was a collaboration between Ian Fleming and the OSS to um, sensualize espionage and specifically um, uh, spies and the government doing whatever they want to do. Like, I agree with all that. Uh, I mean, my mind just totally shifted to like military, like phase one, phase zero operation type thinking. Uh, when we moved into Iraq, our first move was to um, take down all the Saddam statues and, and collect up all the Saddam money and to begin erasing all of the uh, cultural uh, icons and collective cultural memory of that regime. So it's, and this isn't just something that's um, new to 20th century or 21st century warfare. It's been, it goes all the way back that, yeah, if you can control the language and you can control the art and you can, can control the cultural memory and, and its statues are all, all these things that are common touch points around which a culture can uh, unite and understand itself. Those are your highest priorities to erase and to get rid of. And that's, uh, are, it makes sense though, why you see statues being ripped down uh, now in a, in the West so aggressively, why language is, you know, just basic terms like male and female are under such vicious attack. Uh, and it's, yeah, these are points of non-kinetic warfare. Yeah. Or even why, you know, I was, I've been trying to find a television show to watch and, you know, as a, as a kid, I didn't have any concept or, or framework to understand like propaganda and what they were doing. But um, now, especially after making so many films in this space and understanding like what propaganda is, I'll sit down and try and watch a TV show like The Last of Us or something. And you make it uh, two episodes in and episode three, it's just 50 minutes of gay sex. Or, you know, I try to watch Billions or something and it's like mediocre, right? Like these supposed to be cr critically acclaimed shows. I tried to watch Mad Men and I couldn't make it past the first episode because it's just so man hating and... Mm and whatnot and then um yellowstone was another one so and i think yellowstone is an interesting one because you think like oh western right and you have kevin costner and this this should this should have the um the substance of of the old westerns and what's funny actually is yellowstone does have the substance of the old westerns but it has the substance of the old judeo-buddhist westerns which <laughs> Once again, it's like it's literally like the Pocahontas woman that ends up reprimanding like white men and mm -hmm. telling you like this is this is where you're wrong. And, um, you know, even again, the father in that who is alive is like an antihero. You know, he's he's a terrible he's a terrible person. Uh, you can, you're not allowed to like Kevin Costner's character in Yellowstone. You're not allowed to. He's a bad man. And mm -hmm. all of the all of the white men are either gay or or let their um, love interests sleep around with other men um, or their imperialists and racists. So that's why I'm saying like, you have to look at who's making the films and what, what their intention is. And then when you do have a diamond in the rough, it never comes from the people who made those uh, bits of propaganda. It never does. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to, um, I just had my second favorite, Miyagi complex film um arguably rivaling my first was the the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie a great a really good movie a really solid movie that um has the trope it's Master Splinter who is a basically a Japanese sensei uh who is a rat yes that 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 adds an element of <laughs> incredibility and he's a, a father figure to four essentially Japanese turtles so he's he's more like their biological father if we uh, stretch this absurdity a little further but he's a surrogate father he's a miyagi to this kid danny uh who is uh, a wayward youth who actually falls in with master shredder who is who is a, a, a the japanese villain in this danny has a white father danny's a white kid who is a newsman who doesn't care much about him so he's falling in with bad surrogate father, Master Shredder. He happens to, in the course of the events of the film, 
meet Master Splinter, who's another Eastern father figure, this time a good one. And um, Splinter actually, it's not pure subversion. Splinter actually coaxes him to go back. Hey, look, go back to your white father. He's, he's all fathers love their sons. All fathers love their sons is a direct quote from the movie. If only that were true, right? But but this is it's less subversive, even though um, Master Splinter is the one that's really teaching Danny what he needs to know. So it is Miyagi complex. The white father does actually love his son. And the end of the movie is Danny being reunited with his father and his father being somewhat having more of the properties of a, a good father than most of the other Western white father, bald with glasses father. It's it's a little bit less subversive, but it's the exact same thing. All fathers love their sons. And he's teaching him again in broken English, just like Miyagi in the savage aphoristic grunts. He's teaching him deep prudential practical wisdom with all of these elements of romantic past looking, the moral corruption of the West, you know, Splinter is the most savage of all the noble savage idealized indigenes, right? He's a rat for heaven's sakes, a karate doing rat. Um, he's got the wisdom of Miyagi, but the looks of uh, a rodent. And um, again, what's being underscored here is if you don't need a redeemer and if nature is inherently good, then Christianity and all these white Western fathers who don't really practice their Christianity in the first place must be futile. And look at them. They're not practicing it. But, you know, you have both sort of the, the means and the motive to make the the claim like Christianity was never real in the first place. You don't even need a redemptor. You just need to learn and, Buddhism. And, and then it makes all of institutions that stem from the christian west they're, they're unjust they're they're these oppressive uh restrictions they're authoritative tyrannical restrictions that have no no heft and no justification behind them right they're they're unnecessarily right. restricting one's uh union with uh the, the benevolent uh mother nature right exactly the que so one question, there are two two questions that sound like these big, big gay aporia that people ask sometimes in podcasts where they never answer them. I, I have an answer for each of them. They're both kind of vast, though. So they, they have the, the danger of sounding like those aporetic questions. One is, is this Miyagi complex Judeo-Buddhism in film uh, art imitating life or vice versa, life imitating art? And I do have an answer for that. Uh, also, is this an instance of the father repudiating the son or vice versa. I mean, at the beginning of the postmodern era, I would say Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, and Kierkegaard, the three smartest postmoderns, the three initiators of postmodernism, Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, Kierkegaard. Two of the three are actually Christian, but they're dissenting Christians. One's Orthodox, one's Protestant. And Nietzsche is, of course, a famous atheist. They all cover a repudiation of the father. Kierkegaard repudiated his own father when he found out that his father shook his fist at the sky, at God. Nietzsche repudiated his father's Lutheranism and became an atheist. His father was a Lutheran pastor. And of course, Dostoevsky, every one of the four great novels is about some sort of patricide or conceptual patricide, at least. The great novel, Brothers Karamazov is a thousand page read about a patricide and the four sons who each contributed to it in one way or another. So is this the repudiation of the father by the son, not the repudiation of the son by the father? I would say no, just so you know, I'm not casting it as an unanswerable question. I would say in the postmodern era, you have Daniel's son saying, I'm not going to mourn my father. I'm going to go get another father figure and kill Bill. You have her saying, like most men who never knew their father, Bill collected father figures. You have Kierkegaard saying, well, my father messed up, so I'm going to reject him. Uh, Dostoevsky says, my father is Fyodor Karamazov, a bad man. So one of the four sons is going to kill him and the other three will contribute more or less directly. All of this is that the father first, first repudiates his kid and Karate Kid, you don't even have a father. It's it's um, I don't think they were ever married, the mother and the father in uh, TMNT and, and of these other movies, you get um, a very explicitly intoned uh, point 
in the movie of inflection where, you know, the kid says, oh, my dad doesn't love me. He's never said he's proud of me. And all of us in the West are watching these screens going like, yeah, I don't I mean, I'm not, not that our fathers never loved us, but I've never I've never I've never really been told like a like a sensei that that my father's proud of me. I mean, Pope Benedict, right before he absconded, he said, this is the age of absconding fathers. Like they're touching something deep in our soul in every single movie. That's good. All these are good movies, by the way, um, has to deal with this because it is the central characteristic of our age, not just in film. Film is good if it touches on it. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like we're critiquing this. We're not critiquing it. Everyone wants a sensei. Dwight Schrute in the office wants a sensei. Remember, everyone wants to be a senpai to someone. What do you say, Nick? How could it ever be the child's fault? How, like, yeah, they are they are the recipient of whatever it is. It is ultimately the father's responsibility, um, at least at least unto a certain point. I mean, every every child has free will um, after the age of reason and um, can choose to reject their father. But I mean, all atheism is a rejection of the father in some form. And so. Yeah. Um, the simulacrum that is the Eastern religions and thoughts are uh, necessarily stemming from an insufficient father. So, right. yeah, I think it, I think it does fall on the shoulders of, of dad to be there. And um, what m I see my generation and in yours as well, but very much so mine in those who are self-aware um, is they are implicitly, even if they don't have the words for it, recognizing that a dad's supposed to be friends with his kid. It's supposed to be that way. And yep. they can be friends with their kid and not be a second mother. And they're going to figure out a way to do that. Um, so I am curious to see if, but the, I mean, you're right. Film, the only reason film works is because it's showing you something real, but the magic trick, the insidiousness is that it, it twists it at the very end. It's a little fishtail at the right. end like you um you can tell a great a great formulaic story and then you just oh but it's a woman doing it it's like well no mm -hmm. it's, it's not a woman doing it she she doesn't do karate okay she can't heel kick a man through a door so like <laughs> you you kind of got me at the end there but the story was great and so you're like all right well i love i actually do kind of like this movie because it did something for me well, of course it does you wouldn't go you wouldn't go buy it an eight dollar movie ticket if it doesn't do that um, right. And that's that's, of course, why films, the very, very few films that don't give you that fishtail uh, perversion at the end rise so, so far above, but, you know, the Lord of the Rings type films. But I just want to remind everyone out there, for one thing, like like this video and subscribe to the channel. We're racing to 50,000 subscribers on the channel. If you're wondering Will Noland uh, ha had to run to Stations of the Cross, Veneration of the Cross, and we were hoping he would be in for the second half of the movie. He just said he's he's not going to make it the second half of the show today. Elliot is busy. We had the uh, the original author of the phrase Judeo Buddhism in film, Royce White, lined up. He's doing a Fulton Sheen special tonight, and his producer got sick, so he sends his apologies. Uh, so it is uh, happily, it's a, a smaller group today. It works out well with Nicholas Stumphauser, who is the director of Died Suddenly and five other films, uh, uh, Michael J. Robillard. Nick, are you a Nicholas J? No, Nicholas A. You're a Nicholas A. Yeah, that's right. Uh, anyway, so we have Michael, Michael J. Robillard, myself, Timothy J. Gordon, and Nicholas A. Stumphauser steering the ship here today. I, I want to take it another direction. I want to say, look, um, this is not us spinning together, weaving together some yarn. We're like, look, we, we did all this ourselves. Look at the cleverness of how we're finding the noble savage, the, the Miyagi complex father figure, in, in all of these Judeo-Buddhist films. It's there in almost any film worth watching. And it sounds like we're critiquing these films. Some of these are some of my very favorite movies. Okay, I want to go to Star Wars next, which is in some sense, even though it's not East-West, 
it is the best instance of Judeo-Buddhism. We should talk about the sensei figure for several generations now. That is Master Yoda. He's master like, like any of these senseis. And we've been talking all, all day without really saying it. We, and Nick just said it. We watch these movies because they're touching something deep in our soul. The ones who are the subverters who are making these films know that the West has been bankrupt since at least before around the time Nietzsche said God is dead and Kierkegaard repudiated his father and Dostoevsky wrote four great novels about repudiating your father. Like, like Nick said, the, the father in the West, Christianity, the biological father repudiated his sons first, and he did so by giving up the birthright, which is the truth, which is Roman Catholicism. I mean, which literally built all of the West. So all of this is an attack. It's attack porn. Uh, it's assault porn on Roman Catholicism. And again, if you don't believe it, I, I quoted this Al Goldstein quote, who was the 1974 founder of Screw Magazine. He said, the only reason that, that we... Jews are in pornography is that we think Catholicism sucks. Uh, uh, we and I don't believe in authoritarianism in any form. And of course, Catholicism is the one true form of authority, right? The love of the father, which has the rightly ordered version of all of these properties and more that a father ought to have. God, the father, we can call Jesus father here on Good Friday. And so there, these movies Judeo-Buddhism are weaponizing against us in the West. Things, a mixture of lie and truth. The true parts are what we already know. Man, I want a hug from my dad. Man, I want my dad to teach me how to tie a tie and shave. Man, I want my dad to teach me to get the bullies, but in a principled way, not to become a bully myself. And man, I want my dad to teach me about suffering the true way, not this BS pseudo-Oriental LARPing where you say suffering's okay or I'll just desire not to suffer. Take me to the cross and teach me to sacralize my suffering, Father. We all want that. It's a deep spot in our soul. It's what you'd even call yearning, and we are not getting it. But I, I want to, if you guys can, I want to talk about Star Wars for a little bit, because I think Star Wars, even though it's not as deep as uh, Karate Kid, it's got all of these elements noble savage idealized into gene that think of that that's yoda the wisdom of yoda the practical noble savage like wisdom of yoda who speaks in these miyagi like savage aphoristic grunts uh romantic past looking think of obi-wan kenobi looking at a blaster and saying uncivilized thing instead of using a a, a lightsaber which is a saber the weapon of the samurai so it's got the romantic past looking, the moral corruption of modernity in the West, the need to return eastward, to return back to the samurai way, the, the light saber. Uh, Nature is inherently good in this vague Confucian or Buddhist sense. There is no need for a redeemer. All there is is the need to understand that desire leads to suffering. And of course, um, remember Yoda says, do not mourn those who have become one with the force or something like that. Um, so all that's needed is this Buddhist, Shinto, Confucian, uh, noble savage-like approach to suffering. Uh, what what say you guys, Nick? Nick, you take the first pass. Yeah, the, uh, the tiny, aged, aphoristic throwing Yoda, right? Um, who rides around on the back of of Luke and uh, yeah, I was also going to bring up like the midichlorians with their, you know, nature being good and um, the, the, the spirit of Gaia flowing toward the Messiah, the Mashiach of, of Anakin. Like I've often wondered what in the world Lucas was on. Um, it's, it's often fascinating to try and like look at the creators of these things and see, you know, is there any clue to what they were pulling from? And you know, he was from that era of um, kind of the vestiges of, of science fiction and then the dawn of the West, for some reason, taking a deep and great interest in the East. Mm. Um, 
which is which is where a lot of that came from. But yeah, the, the, the pornographers went into film. Like they went into storytelling. The pornographers went into storytelling. The same people that you were just describing said, all right, we're going to try and tell stories. And they did the exact same bait and switch, um, which is take something that's good uh, that we have a yearning for and uh, twist it. And um, that, I don't know how specific we want to be with the phrase Judeo Buddhist, but it's not the Buddhist that does the twist. It's not the Buddhist that does the, the magic trick at the end there. It is the, it is the magic trick of it, uh, the substance is what makes pornography a magic trick. And that's what's happening with the narratives of film and uh, you know, Star Wars. Again, you think it's, it's Western because there's combat. But it's not all of the most quintessential moments of that film, even Obi-Wan being struck down. It's like, oh, don't fight, actually. <laughs> right. Let go, be struck down and, and um, uh, don't look and you'll you'll hit the things and don't don't look and you'll shoot the target and right. new hope and all these things it's like reach out with your feelings. Right. Yeah. He's mm, like, mm. try it again with the with the uh vision shield down and and han who again is he's at least he's cool but he's like the the clueless uh dopey western guy at least he's kind of macho right very macho but he's like what the wtf but then then he puts the blast shield down and all of a sudden he starts hitting so he knows exactly what to do because he's one with the force right may the force be with you there's nothing more buddhist than that with your spirit you know like <laughs> you know with your spirit yeah right and and also with you with your spirit yeah this gets back to to i think what i was trying to articulate at the beginning with miyagi right is that the this idea that the the mentor has to teach this esoteric knowledge that it, it's not empirically or rationally discernible like i don't know like western boxing or western wrestling for instance right it has to be the like the the, the secret death touch that or the, the yeah. secret the secret chi maneuver or something right that like it, you have to suspend rational and empirical investigation in order to get the the hidden uh, nugget of wisdom that yeah. on, on, only the elect after you know a, a certain amount of um, discipline are able to get access to so i think that you see that with with yoda as well and in all the instances that, that you just mentioned, right? It, it can't just be, oh, that the world is, God has made the world and it is intelligible and we have reason and capacities to understand that world. No, it's mysterious. The mentor's teaching is mysterious and you have to just trust into this, this veil of nature worship. And then on the back end of it, then, then the, the kernel of wisdom is suddenly revealed. Yeah, it's yes. anti-rational in that in that sense, um, Michael, because it's the idea that the true success of man is the surrender of critical faculties. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where yeah. in the world did that come from? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, you have, I mean, it's in there. It's in TMNT. It's in Karate Kid. It's in The Last Samurai when he repudiates the West at the end, right? It's in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which is a beautiful film. If you like all the magic and the flying, as Andy Dick says, it's there in Star Wars. Put the blast shield down and you, you'll get it. It's in Avatar. It's in Kill Bill. Think of Kill Bill. The call, you, you just hit it for me. I wasn't planning on saying this. The five point palm exploding heart technique. The father figure, Pai Mei, who's not a Miyagi type insofar as he's, he's mean, and he teaches only girls, not boys. It's, it's very postmodern, so it inverts a lot of these leitmotifs. But it, the, the, the culmination of the film, the climax, is that he secretly taught her this Gnostic wisdom mm -hmm. that he wouldn't teach anybody, and she uses it at the end. Very, very, very Judeo-Buddhist, right? It's the, the Hollywood version of Buddhism, where you suspend your five senses, which are part, which, which fertilize your, your rationality, and you suspend your rationality yourself, and then you can be the most mm -hmm. uh, masterful Jedi master uh, um, 
Which is funny because yeah. it's it's submission to what they're trying to say is it's submission to nature as opposed to submission to virtue in Christ, right? Like the West, the, the true Catholic story, the true Christian story is submission to the logos will give you success and not worldly success. Again, this is this is the other thing, too, is that um, the the biblical story is not one of conquering or at least not by us. It's not conquering by uh we the followers of christ christ conquers you know we don't thwart our enemies christ thwarts the enemies and in fact we get boiled in oil and crucified upside down and struck on the other cheek that's what happens with us and so uh once again in like this mcdonald's buddhism judaic sort of way you have in the east or these eastern leaning films it's like well you can get all that you want you can conquer the bully you can solve your immediate world problem. You're going to do it by submitting to the Gaia, you know, mm. <laughs> the way of the way of the water or whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, Everyone that's, loves that quote. Everyone loved that quote as a kid, the, the Bruce Lee. Yeah, they right. thought it's so deep because they don't have Catholicism. And it's and what's funny is I guess maybe this is a, a foil to that would be in fact wow I just I just realized this perhaps Indiana Jones is that because Harrison Ford's character you know you have the the sword swinging swinging guy and he just shoots him that that is kind of the story of Indiana Jones like my uh, my being Indy rationality and yearning and intrigue and curiosity <laughs> is going to solve this riddle and i'm gonna do, i'm gonna pick right and the very last moment i'm gonna pick the right chalice but did we just find the opposite of the uh judaic buddhist film? yeah is it indiana jones maybe it is that you, you i hadn't thought of that before you said that i mean the perfect thing is the scene you just those two scenes yeah you might have just found it nick I, yeah, I mean, but Indiana Jones is like a, a wayward father. We find out in part four, which is a, a True. an unduly maligned, uh, great film. I think you and I believe that right. together. Yes. We, last time you were at my house, we found that that the, the, the people people crap on that movie, but that's that's a good one. But he's a wayward father, and he's womanizing, and he's not religious, and he's skeptical. He's science right. skeptical. But yes. Yeah, it's it's dope that Indiana Jones just picks up a gun and shoots the the sword wielding guy. Like it's the inversion of what Obi Wan Kenobi says about a blaster, this uncivilized thing. After he shoots General Grievous, instead of hand to hand combat, uh, that might just more be a, a celebration of technology or something. But yeah, I like what you're saying about the chalice. Choose wisely. You know, use your knowledge of Western civilizational history. Uh, archaeologist man yeah. uh, adventuresome archaeologist man use your knowledge of the cup of the carpenter and Christianity and the history of Europe to bring you to faith I, I think Ooh. I think the uh, the father of the porn star Mr. Steven Spielberg will probably have a different form of subversion in those films but in the sense of the uh, that we've been talking about, it does seem to be a foil. Yep. That's, that's very good. That's very deep. That's very deep. Um, yeah. Become one with the force. May the force be with you. I mean, who didn't grow up saying that who didn't grow up watching Kung Fu films and be like, be the way of water. Bruce Lee mm. was, was a shyster, but he learned how Hollywood worked. He learned how Judeo Buddhism worked. Look, Americans and everyone that watches American film, which is all of the Western world, they all want a father. You know why? Because God, the father created us such that our hearts are restless until it rests in, in a father in, in him. And he gave us these, you know, call no man father. He gave us these dads as surrogates for him while we're here. And they're supposed to do a good job. Their path to heaven. If they're lay people is through being good surrogate dads for god the father and none of them are doing their job and catholicism has over the last hundred years or so abandoned us the the, the time period when the primary uh, uh hand washing uh ritual sacrifice stopped being the roman catholic mass and it started being going to the movies 
And yeah. so we literally in, in the last in the 20th century came to watch a kind of pornography in storytelling, which is that Catholicism sucks. Authoritarianism sucks, to quote Al Goldstein. Uh, mm-hmm. And this is the reason that uh, according to him, I don't know much about it. I'm just quoting him. Like, this is the reason they're in pornography or film. So I do. Well, first of all, I have I'm guilty of sacrilege. And, a, and after um, recent events, it's definitely become more, far more tongue in cheek. But I used to I used to call going to the movies, going to church because it was a it was a lapsed Catholic and I would not attend mass, um, you know, vehement atheist. But when I would go to the movie theater and you, you know, you enter and you turn right, that very first right hand turn with the lights going down filled me with this sense of like uh, the quickening of, of I'm about to experience a narrative and it's going to be larger than life. And I'm going to be very excited and compelled by it. And it was spiritual for me. It's very much like church. Um, and it makes me something that I've been thinking about this conversation is like, well, Christian films have just gotten uh, railed against with good reason for the last 25 years, 20 years that they've really tried to make like Christian films. And the answer is because they suck. Christian films are terrible. <laughs> and yeah. the only good Christian film is the passion of the Christ in Lord of the Rings. Um, and I think that's twofold. First of all, the people who are in control of the studios that create films are not Christians. They aren't. No, I think they might be like Muslim or something. I, I, I'd have to look into the data as to who the primary demographic is, but I know it's not Catholics. Um, and then secondarily, it's I think we've been lobotomized in the in the part of us that recognizes that narrative is Christological. I know me specifically, Tim, you and I have even had these conversations in the past where, I'm, where I've said I've said things like, well, Christ is not masculine. And yeah. you're like, well, that's not true. And I'm like, well, but he's like, not like, he's like a hippie. And you're like, well, that's not true. And it's, but, but that's what it appears is that the, the story, the narrative of Christ and of logos itself is one of the femininity and weakness and self-immolation as opposed to achievement and as opposed to gratifying the yearnings that we have that you, that you spoke about. Um, and so in place of that, that, that vacuum is filled with people um, and stories that seem correct because they gratify the yearnings, but they're gratif- they're disoriented in their gratification. Um, and so I'm curious if, if I've, if either of you guys have uh, insight into good Catholic stories, stories that gratify our yearnings in a properly oriented fashion and what maybe we can do to tell good Catholic stories. 310 to Yuma, I think even more in a, in a, a way that's particular to the West in a way that shows self-sacrifice as the manliest and as the most Christian, uh, you know, the, 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 the culminating weapon is called the hand of God. And the con- religious conversion comes by a villain looking at the cross and thinking, I want to be a Christian. Uh, the villain played by Russell Crowe, who's actually said that in real life. I, I Someday I think I'd like to become a Christian. I think 310 to Yuma, the remake, Christian Bale and Russell Crowe, I think the greatest two living actors. Uh, that's, I think the model going forward but look i want to repeat it michael i want to hear what you say about this about fathers i like everyone out there that's watching or listening to this would pick 100 times out of 100 mr miyagi over no father or mr miyagi over john crease i would pick master yoda over uh the emperor the very very white mean emperor darth sidious i uh would pick master splinter over master shredder in that case the you know master they're they're both kind of japanese but the point is i'm with everybody the 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 magic trick is to 
take something true and put a false spin on it like Nick keeps saying. So these are great movies. I don't think any of these are crappy movies aside from Avatar, which I don't know so much about. But um, but all of these are good movies. I mean, Karate Kid, Last Samurai, TMNT, Crouching Tiger. That's an amazing movie. Lee Mu Bai is the man. I mean, I, I want I want a mentor, a sensei that teaches me to be as based as Lee Mu Bai with the green destiny. Are you kidding me? Star Wars, Kill Bill. Um, I want to talk about uh, uh, Last of the Mohicans, Dances with Wolves and Legends of the Fall by way of closing. But Mike, what do you say about this? I mean, if the only alternative to Mr. Miyagi is John Kreese, then give me Miyagi all day long. What we're proposing here on Good Friday is that the lie is that is is in the false dichotomy. John Kreese is not the only other way. Jesus on the cross is father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's correct, and, and what I said is correct. And yeah, I can I can really only think of yeah the the passion and the Lord of the Rings trilogy as being the the, the correctly ordered view of of what yeah you know, rightly ordered masculine archetypes ought, ought to look like that we can look to. Um, I guess Gibson ought to be producing the way well, he's, he's got the um the the um resurrection movie coming out soon so i guess that'll be the, the third um i can't think of anything else though i mean yeah i, I i'm that exhausts that i think within film what we can look to i mean maybe maybe you could go back to like early golden era cinema there might be instances uh that you can you can find i don't know um but uh yeah i think those are the, the two only contemporary films that i can think of you guys forgot one the the great one i think it's the greatest film of all time both of you forgot one and it was as a matter of narrative fact the template for passion of the christ it's why mel gibson cast jim caviezel as christ the thin red line uh terrence malick film by hollywood's crypto christian he's not a catholic where all of these elements that are spellbinding about Miyagi that we mentioned before. He's he's a better soldier than your racist white grandpa who interned him and probably cheered that his wife and only Miyagi kid died. Uh, he's a better soldier. Well, so is Wit, Jim Caviezel's Christian character in Thin Red Line. Everyone go out and watch this movie on Good Friday. He tells Sergeant Welsh, played by Sean Penn, who does an amazing job in the film, I am twice the man you are. He's an AWOL soldier that keeps jumping A1. And he's like, I'm twice the man you are. I'm twice the soldier when I put my mind to it. We, uh, the film is comprised, uh, I won't spoil it, but it's three dialogues throughout the course of the film between Christian Wit, played by Jim Caviezel, and non-Christian uh, Sean Penn, who's a skeptic. He says the whole World War II is all about property. The whole effing thing's about property. He tells him, I'm twice the man you are. And he tells him, I've seen another world there, Top. Uh, it's it's not just this, this rock. And Sean Penn keeps saying, no, it's just this. It's this rock. So Sean Penn in that movie, in that, in that Terrence Malick film, beautiful, beautiful work of art, is the one that's like... He's not such a bully. He's kind of stoic and 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 nice, and he does some admirable things in the film. But he is the Western white faced, pale faced father who would abandon his kids, not meanly, but because he's so damn skeptical. He doesn't have the patrimony of the church, and Wit is actually the third way, the true Christian who is willing to sacrifice himself for it all. That has seen another world, that calls Jesus Father. And that sacrifices it at all. And that that is an explicitly, if crypto, uh, Christian film. And that is why Mel Gibson said he cast Jim Caviezel as wit. You know, it's uh, a very young medium. Film is extremely young. It's, it's about a century old, give or take 20 years. I guess he could give 20 years at the turn of the century. We were putting short stories on celluloid um, but it wasn't really until the 20s and 30s and then the shift to talkies that we took the the greek play and put it on screen 
and we're able to stack the mediums. That's why I think film is the highest art form is because it couldn't be otherwise. Like we, we kind of cheat with film. You get music, you get composition, you get narrative, you get thespianism. You have all of these art forms wrapped into one, like you can't not win. So of course, because it's the most potent weapon, it's going to be uh, subverted and absolutely has to be but it's a very young medium. So there, and, and now it's democratized. So like the fact that I at 24 can make as many films as I can is unheard of. That's impossible. Like that's, that's a, a, a half century. Well, maybe not, but that's like a good 30 year career that I've had in the last few years that you could only do with millions of dollars in nepotism in the past. So I'm excited to see if in the future or over the next 10 to 20 years, as all of like the 99.9% .9 of film content continues down the path of just utter degeneracy, if the 0.1%, we start to see some really rising stars of like beautiful film work. Yeah, I'm I not, think that's, that's it's all really hopeful to hear. I think that's right. Um, I'm no director. But I, I heard you say film on celluloid or cellulite and thespianism. And I, I would suggest maybe those two things go together, the, cellul the cellulite and the thespianism, Nick. Um, yes, both are an estrogen problem. <laughs> um, look, when the Occidental, uh, under the Judeo-Buddhist film structure of the last 30 years, when the Occidental stays Occidental, and doesn't return to the East in order to depict at least one Miyagi type admirable man. Uh, if it stays Occidental, it goes Rousseauvian noble savage. And I, I want to close talking about Miyagi complex when it stays Western, which is the American Western, particularly last of the Mohicans, uh, which is a, a great novel. I love the novel itself. I love the movie. It's Daniel Day Lewis. So who can not love it? Again, all of these are great movies, but you know, Dances with Wolves, exact same thing. Last Samurai is the Oriental Occidental Oriental. So it's the exact same thing. The Last Samurai, The Last of the Mohicans, Legends of the Fall, Mike, you contend is the same. But I want to talk about Chingachgook as the Miyagi figure. Um, it's the exact same thing. Natty Bumpo, Hawkeye. For one thing, James Fenimore Cooper wrote about the adventures that uh, Natty and Chingachgook had uh, uh, together with uh, Chingachgook's son, Uncas, in like five different stories. And Natty became a tall tale figure for early America. So this proves that it's not just Hollywood, Judeo-Buddhism. It's something deep there in the American, probably Protestant sense of longing. Uh, Nick, you've been talking about the deep anti-authoritarianism of the Judeo in Judeo Buddhism, there's also a deep anti authoritarianism, as we were speaking before, film world in the wasps in the Protestant tradition. They can't deal with the idea of any man ruling over them, which is probably why they have some sort of issue with fathers, aside from the fact that all of our fathers who are pale faces have uh, collectively, anyway, abandoned us. Last of the Mohicans. There's a spin on the movie that's not there in James Fenimore Cooper's novel. And here's the spin. And it makes the whole point. It puts the exclamation point on this very episode of Rules for Retrograde's Christian Masculinism. Uh, so Hawkeye, who is a white man who has repudiated Western culture, sound familiar, to go live with the last remaining Mohicans to have all these adventures, only one of which is depicted in the film. Um, he's actually the same age as Chingachgook, who in the movie translation is made into a generation older than him. They're actually much closer to the same age, Hawkeye and Chingachgook in the book. But um, in the film, he and Uncas, Chingachgook's son, are cast as peers so that you get this Hollywood translated uh, Miyagi figure where... At the end of the film, you have a beautiful, beautiful shot of Natty or Hawkeye and Ching Chingachgook looking at the West. And he's literally standing there with the last of the Mohicans. And instead of it being him, a white man and his friend, 
Chingachgook as it is in the book, Hollywood knew, no, every great story in our generation, you know, 100 years after the story was originally written, 150 years, has to be a father replacement tale because we live in the age of absconding fathers. So they made Chingachgook his father figure. But I would just say in every appreciable way that Miyagi is a father figure for Daniel's son, Chingachgook is for um, for Natty. Except this is more like, you know, Daniel's son plus 20 or 25 years once he's been under the tutelage of Mr. Miyagi for 25 years. Uh, now now they're both kind of badasses. And what do you guys say? It's funny that, once again, the submission to nature, mm-hmm. and in this mm-hmm. sense, it's submission to... Um, the Native Americans, right? The Indians here in the United States, where it's like, well, they have this deeper, more intimate understanding of how reality and nature work. And really the white man should submit to that. And the, all of the white man's problems come from his uh, refusal to mm-hmm, mm-hmm. integrate with, with nature. And it's like, no, you're there. They were savages. They were savages that we brought christianity to and you have to flip that on its head like if you're a judeo buddhist storyteller in hollywood you must flip that on its head you cannot let the story get out that it was white western christianity that edified a people that can't be the case no no yeah look at look at the spin uh in all of these elements of the noble savage idealized indigene uh chingachgook who again i love him too he's a badass uh it it it, instead of having the wisdom of chingachgook or miyagi that is apophatic right It, it it's a rejection of your systematic reasoned categories that's the western thing yeah, the white man tries to get at wisdom through non-apophatic ways. We try to reason with our in the Aristotomus way. That must be wrong. The noble savage like Chingachgook or Miyagi speak in these savage aphoristic grunts that are very profound. Just go think about them. Uh, the white man actually bothers to write them down in systematic treatises like Aristotle. That can't <laughs> be right. Um, that, whereas the noble savage is romantic and past looking. The, the last of the Mohicans, the last samurai, the last starfighter. The um, Christianity is truly humanistic and truly future looking. Our, our, our Keo futurism is a term coined, I just found it out yesterday, by Steve Turley. It's always got to be informed by Christianity when the Western version of futurism is hijacked by Judeo Buddhist types. Well, that just becomes technocracy. And yes, we all know that's hollow. That's, you know, robots as our masters, T2 type documentaries, as Nick would say. Um, The white man uh, has this morally corrupt push westward. It's called Manifest Destiny in uh, America, or it was. It's called uh, westernizing, if you ask the Russians. The, the, you know, the Far East was closed off until the middle of the 20th century to the West, and they too saw it as corrupt. That's wrong, according to the Judeo-Buddhists. There's a need to return eastward, like uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the, the plot of, of Gatsby is the, the corrupt return eastward. At least he's still Western enough to say, no, we should, we're Westerners. We should push West. In Lord of the Rings, you take, you take the, the ships West, right? There's a West East thing. Jesus sits sits on the right hand side of the Father as we look at him. That is left. Nature for the noble savages. Miyagi's the Buddhist uh, Shintoist version. Chingachgook is the shapeshifter American Indian version. Nature's inherently good, which means that Christianity that says nature has been corrupted by Adam and Eve's fall requires a redemptor. It's a middle way that we say between. All men are bad. All men are corrupt, brute, John Kreese. And all men are naturally good if they just take off their pants and barely cover their private parts, like Chinkachkuk, right? That's what you really do, according to the Judeo-Buddhists. There's a needlessness of a redemptor. All that's needed for a Buddhist or a, you know, a shape-shifting uh, American Indian religionist is their 
Oriental approach, their foreign approach to suffering. Instead of sacralizing it, go to the foot of the cross. That's all Judas had to do, by the way, after he screwed up. Just go to the foot of the cross and kiss Jesus' feet and beg forgiveness. It'll be uh, offered in an instant. That's all the other 10 apostles had to do on Good Friday, by the way. If they didn't want to die martyrs' deaths, go to the foot of the cross. The one that didn't have to die a martyr's death was John, the one who had the balls to show up. But Eastern pseudo-Stoicism is what's represented by Limubai, uh, by Miyagi, by Chingachgook, by uh, Master Splinter. Think about it. Uh, I already said Yoda, didn't I? By Pai Mei in Kill Bill. Brad Pitt's uh, character the- in uh, Legends of the Fall. That's right. Brad, Brad Pitt is the Natty Bumpo, isn't he? Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I need to watch that. He's it's, he's Hawkeye. He it's abandoned a great movie, movie, but it's it's like he only wins. Literally, the white woman loses, and the white man also kind of loses, and you know the father loses. Like the, uh, like everybody that should win in natural law loses in that film, mm-hmm. and what wins is like this Yellowstone chick. Mm-hmm. You know this Pocahontas character, basically, who in, who literally inherits like all of what's good about Western culture, like the all of it, the patriarchy, the, mm-hmm. the civilization aspect of it. And I don't think it's an accident that at the time when the sexual revolution was happening, I don't I don't think you can um, decouple the sexual revolution and this obsession with the East in America and what that did with film mm-hmm. by any stretch of the imagination, like. Tim, you're, you're, you so correctly said that it's not that desires are bad. It's that the desires themselves are good. They must find their, uh, their actualization in that which is truly good. Um, and what, what film has done so perfectly is it says um, in the sexual revolution, uh, desires are good, but instead of constraining the actualization of it, remove the constraints and and all actualizations of the desire then become good. Right. Right. And that's the trick. That's the twist you talked about earlier. Right. In the films, they depict this false dichotomy, the Oriental way or the, the um, idealized indigene way is the best one easily. Anyone would have a brain can tell you of the two depicted the Western way is depicted as the Western non-Christian way. And it's bankrupt. And by the way, I asked this question. It's it's about noon, so I want to cut out because it's Good Friday. But is this art imitating life or life imitating art? What came first, the chicken or the egg? It's definitely art imitating life. Now, I think the Judeo-Buddhist filmmakers have uh, weaponized it and spiked it such that it's, it's now 10 times more potent than it originally was when it was just art imitating life. But I mean... Certainly, it made sense to a Western audience when movies became a popular medium sometime in the 20th century that their fathers, the greatest generation, were no longer true Christians in their hearts. They were no longer true fathers in their hearts. They were no longer interested in imitating Jesus on the cross in their hearts. So they couldn't be good fathers. So the West became morally bankrupt first rather than blaming protestants or uh you know you know buddhists or jews or muslims we ought to blame christianity's self-repudiation and by that i mean real christianity catholicism um it it gave us up and that caused fathers to lose the way how to raise sons how to love sons that's why every great film addresses the problem in one way or another with relative cluelessness i'm not saying the makers of stranger things the uh, Duffer brothers are great Christians who understand what they're doing. No, they're just sensitive guys and good narrative spinners who are describing the phenomenon without the noumenal answer on top. If I can be Kantian for a second, they're just describing it in really, really apt uh, narrative and and in some senses, meta narrative ways. And they're not the ones injecting us with the Christian answer. That's only been done in thin red line, Lord of the Rings, Passion of the Christ. We need that list of films to grow so that we're no longer repudiating our fathers and fathers in the first place, no longer repudiate their sons. I'll give you guys the last word. Uh, Other than that, we should cut out because it's noon here. 
Yeah, I remember one one other one to that list, uh, Tim, is a uh, black robe. It's about a uh, Jesuit priest in uh, Canada who is um, uh, doing missionary work. So I think that that is that is, De Niro. Uh, is yeah, De Niro? I, uh, I believe so. Maybe um, yeah. 1991. But so to that one, but that, that's there. So we got five at least. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think it's like. So much of this is part of our, our cultural DNA now, and it's part of our, our identities, particularly you and me, Tim. And we, we grew up in in this this world, and I think it's it, now looking at it retrospectively, it, it's going to take quite the uh, conscious effort to, to re- rewire things in terms of looking at those works and those those artifacts of of cultural production. Uh, in their proper, proper light. Uh, but agreeing with what Nick said, I think we're, as everything is getting so absurd, like the psyop and the propaganda, especially with the wokeism, it's getting so thick and so overt instead of covert. I think this is a wonderful opportunity for any, anybody who sticks to classical features of, of Christian aesthetics and Christian beauty in Christian narrative, it's a, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for the real true beauty to shine through because you can't, you can't fake that and you can't hide it. And I think contrast it against how absurd the other stuff is getting. I think it, it, it's a great opportunity for Christian filmmakers, but yeah, particularly Christian film, film lovers. Yeah. Particularly for, for young Christian filmmakers who I don't know have recently come back to the faith who are talented, who have, directed uh most recent film with over 50 million views i don't know any like that there's one sitting amongst us but i I think that's really apropos what you just said mike my my last thing i'll say is my favorite section of our co-authored book mike don't go to college is the section in opening where we each contrast but really compare our childhoods We're, we're about six months apart right we're both 42 you grew up in celtics country i grew up in laker country and, um, you know, you grew up with the more, you know, blue collar uh, post Kennedy Democrat mm-hmm. ethos mm-hmm. of Massachusetts. I grew up with uh, in the household of um, California alienated strangers in a strange land, um, California conservatives. But it's it's all the same stuff. It was the MTV culture of mm-hmm. the repudiation of the father. And little did we know that whether it's a literary type or a filmic type. This is because as a historic truth, forget types, um, the patrimony had abandoned us. The church had abandoned us. All great stories in our age must be the abandonment of the father. Even Pope Benedict, right before he absconded, said, we live in the age of absconding fathers. So um, I just think it's it's cool that this is so universal to our lived experience as a couple mm-hmm. of dudes in their young 40s. And it's still true for young young nick here who's almost a full generation younger than us but nick you you are you are the future son let me be a miyagi to you and say as a young filmmaker you can go and make the difference Mm -hmm. yeah there's i'm i'm full of hope if the good lord lets us live another like 30 years and this and we are not hurtling toward armageddon as it's so so looks like at present um, yep. it will be the case that the the good content that comes forth from this from god willing myself and others is going to be the best content we've ever seen it's going to be the, the just the purest most beautiful touching art um, and i'm so excited for that that really does excite me because like you can't I've, I've said this before on other uh, shows or whatever, that it, there's no easier time to be like a good young man today because it's so obvious what all of the bad examples are. Right. It's so obvious what like good art is. Mm-hmm. Be- and it's be- just being proven through exclusion. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Cautionary examples are sometimes more stark than even good examples. And that is... The takeaway principle, all fathers love their sons, says Master Splinter. Like most men who never knew their father figure, Bill collected father figures, says the protagonist of Kill Bill. And um, I've already quoted Al Goldstein twice, so so that should be enough to put a cap on it today. 
uh, our true patrimony is Jesus on the cross. We suffer with him when we're good. We sacralize our suffering when we do right. And when we crown our lives with um, by simply honoring the telos of our lives, which is all about finding and serving the true father. So thank you so much, Nick. Uh, you really enriched the convo today. This is a great, great show. Uh, Mike, thank you. God bless you both. You're both doing this fast with me. I feel a little bit, a little bit dizzy. Uh, that's how dependent on food we all are. Everybody out there, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades, like and subscribe to this video and channel. God bless you. Have a very holy uh, Good Friday. Uh, say your prayers. Do the Stations of the Cross if you can. Say a rosary. Um, if we survive long enough, like young Nick said, I think, I think we might see some reflowering as Mary promised at Fatima. Deus volt.